Welcome everyone to discussion section three B FRBs of probes part two. I'm Xavier. I'm zooming in from Santa Cruz, and I'm thrilled to have co-panelists Dana Smart, Paz Benyamini. <laughs> Sorry, Paz, if I butchered that, and Matt McQuinn. <laughs> We're here to guide the discussion. I see there's about as many attendees as panelists, a few more now. We're happy to promote anyone to chat with us. Um, we all have that power to do to do that. We do have some prepared slides, but uh, this is intended to be a discussion and will. Uh, let me share the slide we prepared. Kick things off a little bit. Um, as we heard throughout the last 24 hours in session, I've actually lost track of the numbers, 11, 10, 11. Um, plenty of science going on now with FRBs as probes. This is a brief summary of a number of the talks, maybe most of the talks that uh, separate into several categories. If you attended 3A, no, yes, discussion 3A like I did 12 hours ago, um, I think we're gonna complement a fair bit of what they did. On the right hand side is uh, some of the areas we thought we'd focus on, um, but the discussion can go wherever you want it to. I thought I'd speak a little bit to this slide. Get rid of that. Which uh, describes a bit of the experiment, mainly to emphasize the complexity. This is not a let's design a CMB experiment, go out and build a single instrument to measure one or a handful of numbers and do it extremely well. This is largely an experiment by convenience. Um, FRBs are wonderful tools, whatever they are. Um, they travel through our universe. They intersect with media at a variety of scales, uh, which imprint their own uh, signatures onto the signals that we measure within them. And that's all before they even arrive here at Earth. Uh, once they arrive at Earth, there's yet another level of complexity to design telescopes and triggering software that detect them, to localize them to uh, precision where we can associate them with a galaxy, hopefully, possibly, and then to uh, measure properties of that galaxy to, in principle, perhaps measure even a cosmic distance and other properties as well. This is complex. There are many selection effects along the way, biases that can influence the experiment in unanticipated manners. And I think we'll be digging into some of that uh, as well tonight. So X, hey, I just can allowed- Can move the, the slide slightly? I think the bottom part is cut off. It's cut off. Oh, look at that. How weird. So X, I, I just allowed everyone in the attendee list uh, the opportunity to unmute as well. So we'll just try oh, cool. out how, how that works. Um, yeah, I, I like that idea. Um, Matt, why don't you speak to this slide? I, I, I resonate with a number of things written in this, although I, I didn't write them. <laughs> um, but they get in the yeah, list. well, and it's, it's meant to be. I, I like if this sparks debate, I, I am totally happy. And I think even some of my opinions have changed, even the last, you know, even today in the even the special session. I think reflects like reflects how like fast things are de developing, and and so so. Uh, I, I I I guess maybe just an overarching thought is that. Like in terms of of fields, like this field is 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 like incredibly dynamic right now. I'm like I'm um really like excited like like by by everything that's been been presented at many of the things that have been presented at this conference. Um, so okay, so so this is uh just kind of a breakdown of of um different uh different science categories like with a focus on cosmology. Um, so. In the category of sure thing science, I, I, we, we heard a bit about rotation measure from Brian and, and Stella's talk earlier today. And, and, and I think this is gonna be, it is interesting and it's gonna continue to be interesting for, for, for probing IGM magnetic fields, primordial magnetic fields, especially CGM magnetic fields. Like, uh, like Xavier has a really influential paper on this. 
Um, so I think I think that's definitely in the category of sure thing science. Um, the the foreground gas scattering constraints are getting really really interesting. I, there's not really any evidence, I would say, at this point, and we're going to discuss this quite a bit, um, and especially uh, when when uh, Dana le leads the discussion. Uh, but the the very high uh, highly scattered bursts that Chime is detecting is is really interesting. I, th I think we're going to know in the next next few years if if there's any any scattering from 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 gas that's not in the host galaxy that's between us and the host galaxy. Uh, it could be that as we go to higher redshifts, where the gas in the CGM of, of galaxies gets de gets denser, that that this the scattering will become important, and it's not important in low redshift galaxies. So I think there's a lot of interesting space to explore. The the profiles of gas around low redshift galaxies it tends to to of kiloparsecs to thousands of kiloparsecs. I think this meeting has demonstrated this is going to be interesting. I am especially highlighting the, the the some of the work that we've seen today from Sunil and um, and, and and Amanda Cook and and uh, and Vikram and Liam Connors really interesting st uh, stacking or or not stacking but detection of uh, of of, of uh, an excess dispersion uh, toward towards. Um, to, to, towards FRBs that have foreground halos. This is, this is really interesting. I think this is definitely going to be science that's going to happen. The, the, and I think this is even despite the fact that we know that they're, the DM host for, for some FRBs is really large, like the, the, the fast burst that was presented in the special session. I think we, we it, I, I'm optimistic that we can get around this, that, that this is not going to be uh, like a, a hang up, but this is something we're definitely going to discuss in this, um, in, in this discussion. I think Vikram already has something to add, which is uh, searching for possible halos at less than 10 to the seven solar mass with implications for dark matter models. Is this referring to lensing? Oh, sorry, I realized that I got unmute. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are you thinking of strong lensing of 10 to the seven solar mass halos or? Yeah, just that it's difficult to do with, um, in, with image based searches. Whereas if we are able to detect time delays of days to months, then that becomes quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I guess uh, maybe I would add that the like at least with standard dark matter the such small halos tend not to to um have the critical dense surface density to lens but uh, uh are you thinking are you are you thinking non-standard dark matter exactly yeah oh, um, I see. anything that um at, at least being able to exclude the existence of such lenses yeah yeah so I, yeah, I think the missing anything category here is potentially the most interesting, and this is maybe a, like the tenor of Wei Li's talk too, is that there there could be just, and likely are just um, ideas that are out there. Like that, there's just this new parameter space that's been opened up with fast radio bursts, and uh, and and maybe we haven't thought of some of the ideas. Clancy. Yeah, so um, coming from an observer and someone who's not very into cosmology, in uh, the Mackay et al. paper, there was this nominal yeah. feedback F parameter, which was sort of what some pe people in the community would represent as feedback and also serve as a bit of a generic smearing effect. Now, yeah. you know, there's a huge community out there that's specifically looking for evidence of, you know, blowback of galactic gas into the um, intergalactic medium at different scales. Is yeah. this... I'm not quite sure where this fits here, but is this still something that we're specifically interested in? Oh yeah, actually, I, yeah, Clancy, I guess with, I would put that in the category of what I'm most interested in. I th and like that's kind of cosmology, but it's also galaxy formation. And, and so the, the the profile of gas around galaxies, I think um, at, at, for me, that seems like it falls in that category. It, 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 do you agree? Yes, if you're asking me. <laughs> Okay, I understand. So as long, I'm just checking that that's uh, specifically in that in that uh, context because you know the yeah. word 
something that is used a lot, right? And so we should use it too. We should make sure we say blah, blah, feedback, feedback, blah, because that's something yeah, that yeah, that's agencies target. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I mean, the reason that there isn't tons of gas in the centers of dark matter halos is because of feedback. And so the at, at some level, this is all about feedback. Okay, ambitious science. So the so th this this conference has had a lot of discussion of very ambitious science. I, I'm not sure how ambitious it is, but it's I would de cl definitely classify it as quite ambitious. There's a lot of um, unknowns, but uh, redshift and reionization FRBs. We talked a bit in the previous uh, discussion th this morning about um, the uh, the frequency dependence of, of, of uh, emission of FRBs and what the plausibility of having uh, ha having emission and, uh, and and being able to see FRBs at, at, at high enough redshifts. Uh, something that's been mentioned even earlier than hydrogen reionization. There have been a lot of papers about hydrogen reionization, and and we've ha we've had a couple of talks uh, in in this conference. But is helium reionization, which is at lower redshifts, so maybe it's less ambitious, but the effect is quite small. It's only seven percent of the electrons, uh, and there they're gonna, there's going to be quite a lot of discussion led by Paz on on uh, hydrogen reionization in this discussion session. Very very ambitious. The and uh, uh, and and I think that there's an the question of how if, if it's if it's something we, we want to pursue or if it's something that just comes out of these FRB surveys um, as they get bigger and bigger is is to do something like like weak lensing but where you're doing it with DM and you're correlating DM for for I think you need about 10 million galaxies or more in order for it to be competitive with cosmology unfortunately when you're competing with like the cosmology is quite a developed subject and you're trying to make one percent measurements of of uh, of of the the clustering of matter, and so the so you need a lot of bursts. You need fewer bursts than you need galaxies for weak lensing, and uh, the where you need billions of galaxies. Uh, and and exactly how many you meet you need depends on uh, DM host, which is the big bugaboo that we're definitely going to discuss. Uh, and then the but the, I think I guess the question is does is this something that we get? Is it it's, it's it might be a, too enormous of an effort and uh, and and is it interesting enough for us to pursue? Because you you do need redshifts for you so you need localizations. Maybe you can do this with photo disease uh, for for the galaxies. And so it's, it seems it seems like it's very hard, but it's something that people are discussing discussed in this talk in this conference um, by Takahashi uh, and and uh, and I think the the chime analysis by uh, Masad that uh, has had uh, is, is early days this type of science where he was uh, was was correlating dm with with large scale structure um okay maybe my most controversial statement is that there we have had a couple of talks about uh, measure, measuring uh dmz and and using this to to constrain cosmology and uh and i I, I'm not. I think this might be something that we want to pursue. I don't know how how precise we can make it. The so so uh, so, so we're like the 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 aim like what in order to be competitive with other other cosmological probes is we need to get this to kind of a couple percent precision, and whether that's possible is is a I think a big if. The like even at the couple percent level, I don't know if we know the fraction of baryons that are not stars. And so that's that's kind of already limit, limiting us to the, the precision that we need. And then let's say you know, if, if we're not able to, to, to um, understand the DM host or DM Milky Way to, to t like 10 par parsec centimeter cubed is that uh, if, our, if our FRBs are at redshift one, that's already another percent. So the, and that's a pretty small number and so, is is this something that we can achieve? Is it something it, we? we uh, I, I think this is an interesting question. Uh, I, maybe that's. A, I made a strong statement. So, if there are any any comments, I'm happy to 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 take them. Clancy. Yeah. So, thanks for bringing this up. The fundamental point I want to make is that. You know, we're rapidly. We've already seen actually from some chime results that FRBs are now the things which are. Um, actually going to be constraining, you know, DM, Milky Way, and so on, right? So at the end of the day, things like the Milky Way uh, dispersion measure, its halo, and all the host parameters, they're simply going to have to be other parameters in the fit that you do with these cosmological tests, 
right? It's going to have yeah. to be all thrown into one big bucket. Sure. And then whether or not you treat these as nuisance parameters or something of fundamental interest just depends on what kind of scientist you are. Any other comments? I think there was another raised hand or two. I can't see the participants while I'm sharing my screen. Yeah, Vikram had his hand up for a second, but maybe the... And people have, we're going to pivot straight to into cosmology in a moment. People can jump in on that, <laughs> on that assertion as much as they wish. Go ahead, Matt, finish up this slide and then let's turn over the yeah, mic. Yeah, okay. And, and then just really quickly, like I, we've heard about lensing and, and constraining omega lens. This is, I think this is a, this is sure thing science, even though it's, it's not in that category, listed in that category. So we're, de we're definitely going to do that. There's constrained solar mass, um, lenses and above. Uh, Whaley's coherent lensing, I guess, I, is in the I put in the missing anything category. This is this is something that's that that could potentially be really interesting. Um, if for for some our our uh, our goal or for for uh, many people are most interested in constraining, maybe not in this this uh, in this conference, but constraining the concordance cosmological picture. And uh, and uh, the for me, what what seems most likely to 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 be able to help with that is constraining gas pro profiles around galaxies, which is a big systematic for weak lensing. And it, it also there's an interesting paper, um, the uh, that will that that's listed later that also shows that this this could be really interesting for for um, for using the KSC, which is a CMB anisotropy, to uh, uh, to to, 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 to kind of calibrate out a, a, a bad systematic and, and use that anisotropy to, 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 uh, to, to measure the growth of, of cosmic structure. So, so the gas profiles is not just interesting for, for feedback uh, as, as uh, Clancy had pointed out, but it's all, I think it's also really interesting for, for, for cosmology. Great, thanks Matt. Um... We're gonna jump into further depth on cosmology and especially broaching the level of percent level cosmology. Um, Paz, please take it away and tell me when to advance. Yes, I wanted to talk a bit about cosmology focus, a bit on the topic of uh, hydrogen reionization, which was already mentioned a few times. Uh, but really it's also as an example of uh, what other types of things we can and can to do with the FLBs as cosmological probes. So first I want to be optimistic and um, I want to uh, mention a few things that work very much in favor of FLBs as uh, cosmological probes. Uh, it's easy to remember, it's the ABCD system. So they're abundant. The number of FLBs per sky per day is about uh, 10,000. Uh, so uh, that's above uh, the threshold that you see here of 0 0.1 Jansky milliseconds. So there are many of them. Uh, you know, compare that with other transients that people have uh, uh, suggested to use uh, for uh, cosmology studies, for example, gamma ray bursts. Uh, of course, they are also um, interesting potential probes, but they are definitely not as abundant as FLBs are. Uh, they're very bright. Uh, in the radio. So uh, one exercise that uh, we have done, just as a sort of an example of um, what do we mean by the fact that they are bright, is if you take the bursts with known redshift and you just put them at a higher redshift at six and above, and you ask how many of them are detectable, and even take uh, a quite conservative uh, spectrum, going here as nu to the minus uh, 1.5 uh, on average, then still tens of percents of uh, FLBs would be detectable uh, even above uh, one Jansky millisecond uh, threshold. So uh, that means that basically you can take the FLBs that we already know exist, put them at those uh, high redshifts, and uh, a good fraction of them should be detectable. Uh, the other thing that you may be concerned about is whether those FLBs are actually produced at those large redshifts. But again, there are good uh, physical reasons to expect that uh, they should be produced at uh, high redshifts even uh, relative to the star formation rate, they may be uh, produced more often uh, than uh, at lower redshifts. We know at high redshifts that um, 
gamma ray bursts occur, so we know that uh, uh, there are uh, uh, the collapses, the stellar collapses that lead to gamma ray bursts. We don't know if gamma ray bursts are uh, coming from neutron stars or black holes. FRBs, there is some evidence that at least some of them are coming from neutron stars, maybe all, we don't know yet. Uh, but there is uh, at least evidence that these core collapses that are required are happening at high redshift. It's also, it makes sense with the physics that uh, we know. Um, the, at the high redshift, we expect to have uh, um, more um, um, mass loss of uh, uh, stars, which uh, will end up uh, leading to um, a lower uh, mass of the, um, of the object after collapse. So uh, there are a few good reasons to expect that uh, these objects should be up. Uh, and finally, the big advantage that FLBs have compared to other transients is that uh, they provide us with uh, the dispersion measure estimate. So this is something that uh, we don't have uh, from uh, um, sources that are seen uh, in uh, uh, higher energies. And uh, it's extremely useful because as we know, uh, once we remove the contributions from the host and from the Milky Way, etc., the excess, which has to do with propagation through the IGM, correlates uh, very nicely um, with redshift. And uh, that is essentially a proxy for the distance. So all these things are kind of uh, telling us that um, FLBs, at least uh, on face value, should be quite useful here. And uh, going to hydrogen reionization, uh, once we go to uh, higher and higher redshifts, eventually, of course, we just run out of a uh, column density that contributes to this DM. There's no more ionizing, uh, ionized material. And so um, uh, we end up at this uh, saturation of the DM level, which is at the level of about 5,000 or 6,000 parsec per centimeter cube. And you see that the exact uh, number uh, depends on what you assume for the, for the history of reionization. So can you go to the... Next slide, please. Yeah, but let me pause there and see if anyone wants to raise their hand and offer yeah. a point or a counterpoint as we go. If so, call on them. Yeah, people should feel free to uh, chime in. So yeah, here is just an example <laughs> of this point, uh, looking at uh, different uh, reionization histories and showing how the DM uh, changes when we change the uh, these realization histories, uh, and you see that uh, the effect can be on the order of maybe a few hundred parsec per centimeter cube. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, and so the, basically the, the kind of exercise that we have here is that um, the important information that we have is in terms of the DM, but of course there is some messiness here because there are contributions coming not just from the IGM, but also from the Milky Way from the source, from the host galaxy, and maybe even from closer to the FLB source itself, from the environment of the FLB. So uh, that's the complication, but there are some good things. So from the Milky Way, we have a, a mapping of the DM along different lines of sight. Uh, and uh, we know that uh, the contribution is limited. It's uh, less than about 300 parsec per centimeter cube, depending of course on the uh, line of sight. Uh, from the host galaxy, this is less certain because we're dealing with the uh, galaxies of different redshifts with different masses to uh, those uh, to the Milky Way. Uh, but uh, there are uh, some good things here. And in particular, uh, there's this suppression by factor of one plus Z due to cosmological expansion. So we looked at some cosmological simulations that have uh, uh, galaxies of different masses and different redshifts. You can see an example in this figure here. And uh, although it's true that when you go to a higher redshift, the intrinsic contribution could be higher, uh, this suppression by one plus Z really makes a big difference. And at the end, we don't expect this uh, factor to contribute much, maybe about 100 parsec per centimeter cubed or so uh, in the kind of uh, relatively more extreme cases. Um, then uh, there's also the contribution from the environment. I should say also about the host that we have some evidence already, definitely from localized uh, FLBs. Um, we, when we know the redshift, we can uh, uh, take away the contribution uh, due to the IGM. 
uh, at least uh, up to some uh, uh, level of certainty in the parameters of uh, uh, this uh, DMZ relation. Uh, and uh, then we can put a limit uh, on the contribution from the host. And we see that those limits for FRBs with redshift are less than about 200 parsec per centimeter cubed, and in some cases much less. Uh, we heard also some talks uh, uh, during this conference that uh, maybe there is a signal of a few hundred parsec per centimeter cubed uh, coming from the chime data. Um, so these things uh, could be there. But uh, the good point is that even if it's a few hundred parsec per centimeter cube, once we go to higher redshifts, if we have an FRB and we can exclude that it's coming from a low redshift and it has a large DM, then we're in good business because a few hundred parsec per centimeter cube that uh, redshift of uh, above six is uh, only a few tens uh, when it comes to our observer frame and compare that to the 5,000 parsec per centimeter cube that uh, is not much and allows us to really do um, a good job in determining, for example, DMX, which as I said before, uh, will tell us about realization history. The final uh, part here is uh, to do with the environment itself. And uh, again, uh, this uh, is limited both by observations and uh, we have some understanding of the physics here and we expect the contribution once the uh, FLB is uh, slightly older, at least uh, older than about 10 years or so, the contribution, for example, from a pulsar wind nebula uh, is going to be extremely small, supernova remnant and contribute a bit more, but uh, even then it's not really competing with those larger numbers that uh, we mentioned. So let's maybe pause here and see if there's some questions or comments by people. I see a question in the chat. Um, yes, okay, so that's a, a good uh, point here made by uh, Shri Harsh about um, the frequency of detection. And this was also mentioned briefly before. So I want to point out that already uh, FLBs are observed from about 100 megahertz and all the way up to eight gigahertz. This is a big range in terms of frequency. The corrections we're talking about in terms of uh, one plus Z, uh, you know, it's a factor of uh, about 10 or, le or less when we're talking about high redshift FLBs. So we already know that uh, these things are emitting at 80 gigahertz, for instance. Uh, and so there will be uh, observable FLBs even coming from those high redshifts in terms of frequency. Any other uh, comments? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think I'll probably follow on from Shuharsh. And yeah, I think the issue is that the emission, well, patchy, I think you either say FRBs tend to burst more at low frequency or the emission's got some steep, steep spectral index. So you are battle, potentially battling something there when you're talking about going up to uh, yeah. high redshift. That's uh, totally agreed. And, and we do take that into account. So when I showed before uh, this um, uh, spectrum that we take on average, we take a relatively conservative spectrum of F nu going as nu to the minus 1.5 on average. Um, I think uh, with what I've seen from observations, this is uh, reasonable, but maybe someone who's uh, really more close to the data wants to comment on that. Yeah, Matt? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I guess I was wondering, um, the, is it like if you had to design a, a high redshift FRB detection machine, what like what frequency would you target? Is, is it like 400 megahertz or, 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 uh, do you, or, or, or lower frequency? Say it again, sorry, I, I was uh, looking at Oh, just, uh, <laughs> yeah, let's say, you know, we know FRBs have emission out to, eight, eight, you know, have been detected at eight gigahertz and, and down to megahertz, hundreds of megahertz. Um, you, so, so uh, but there's definitely less emission as you go higher in frequency. And, and then, yeah. you know, there's a big unknown, like maybe if you, if it's coming from too high of a frequency. Um, and so is there, but I think if you go to too low of a frequency, the, the sky temperature gets too high and you're less sensitive. Yeah. And so is there is there an optimal frequency? Yeah, it's, uh, no. uh, also, also I have to add to Matthew. Sorry. Go ahead, uh, let Vikram add his hand first, then maybe Sri Harsh. Yeah. Um oh, yeah, so I guess just on that last point, I think it I guess it depends on whether we believe that we really care about 
sensitivity for high redshift or whether we just worry a lot about spectral index. Um, honestly, I think it's quite a it's quite a difficult question because I would also argue that we don't necessarily know that FRBs get fainter at higher frequencies. I just don't think we have a large enough sample. Um, yeah, I, honestly, I would say if I were designing such an experiment, I would just go for sheer numbers and hope for the best. So try to go to low enough frequencies to get, you know, as much effective area per element to have as many elements as possible and maximize your detection rate. I think that's that's got to be the way to go. Three hearts. Yeah, I just wanted to add to Matt's uh, point that apart from the sky background increasing at lower frequencies, you also have much more scattering. So your Milky Way is going to cut out a lot of uh, things. So, and I agree with Vikram that in terms of, you know, um, trying to find these, you might just want to, there is a fair bit of ignorance about what the FRB rate is as a function of frequency. So at this point, you might as well just go for maximum number of bursts and then try to see which ones of these are at high frequencies. Thanks. Yeah, and uh, again, uh, what we took as sort of a canonical number in our analysis was nu to the minus 1.5. Um, and I agree that this is still, uh, has very large error bars on that uh, number uh, and we'll just have to see. But also the other point here to make is that we're not extrapolating to uh, very high frequencies with this uh, dependence, right? So we're changing the frequency by a factor of just under 10. So that's the, um, the amount by, it limits the amount by which uh, things can, uh, the number of sources can uh, change. Um, okay, so let's uh, keep going to the next slide. Has could I just ask a kind of a general question for, uh, uh, for for people who are more familiar with the kind of the coherent emission mechanism um, uh, of physics? Like, is is it expected in these different models? Like, or are there predictions in these different models for what the like the high frequency limit should look like? Like, at, like at, I, I guess if I if if I were thinking about like the simplest model of coherent emission, where you just have a bunch of electrons within a wavelength going up and down, then it seems like you can get fewer electrons within a wavelength. But maybe if I'm talking about sh like like high Lorentz factor, you know, shocks, then then it's less clear. Like, uh, th does anyone have have thoughts on this? Well, I I could address if you like. There may be other people. I don't know who are the other people. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah participating, but I could address uh, this. Uh, so most of the model are fairly broadband. So let's take a model that is not my model. Um, uh, it's a far away model, which is the shock model. Uh, it is perfectly capable of producing a broad frequency range from a few gigahertz, five, 10 gigahertz, uh, to smaller frequencies. And uh, the efficiency is, yeah, sure, there is a frequency dependence uh, um, for the efficiency or, or the luminosity, but it's not a very steep function. So you have substantial amount of radiation, uh, coherent radiation that we should expect to see, shall we say at five gigahertz in the rest frame. And um, as Paz and all of you have pointed out already, we are talking about one plus Z effect. So at a rest shift of nine, that's a factor of 10. Um, in, this, in the rest frame of the object at five gigahertz, well, we are looking at something at 500 megahertz, right? And there will be substantial power at that frequency in this faraway model. Well, similarly, in the near field model, uh, in the magnetospheric model, yeah, you will. I mean, Matt, you're right that for coherence, uh, electrons within the wavelength, loosely speaking, one has to be a little careful, and I don't want to get sidetracked uh, by you know, subtlety. So crudely speaking, only the electrons which are within a wavelength are going to radiate in phase. So you are right that you do lose some factor 
because of the coherence length is smaller at higher frequencies. But again, let's not forget that we are seeing things at 1.5 gigahertz is a pretty standard frequency where observations are made going to five gigahertz. We are only talking about a factor of three. Yeah, in terms of the decrease in the wavelength. Yes, sure, it translates to a decrease in the luminosity, but it's not an exponential, by no means is exponential drop. At worst, it's a power law of a modest thing. That's a little getting a little technical, and I would be happy to uh, I would be happy to describe that if there is interest. But I would leave it at that. That there will be some yeah sure there will be a less luminosity, but not dramatically so. Thank you, Bowen. Uh, Vikram or Zorawar, did you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, the Timokhin Aaron's mechanism. You basically uh, generate these superluminal waves at the plasma frequency and. You get a broadband emission because the the pair cascades are non-stationary, so you get a sort of a scale invariant behavior of these uh, discharges essentially, and that generates the sort of power law. Um, the highest frequency is hard to say; it could go to several gigahertz. Sites. Just uh, scaling plasma density or plasma frequencies for kind of typical magnetar crustal oscillation amplitudes. Great. Uh, Paz, I'm going to move on to your next slide. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so kind of uh, bringing us back to um, reionization histories and also to optical depth at reionization. So this is just to show that with this very simple proxy of just looking at DMX, and looking at DMX is something that we can do, which is um, kind of uh, quite easy to do. All we need is a lot of FLBs. Uh, and um, it's something that doesn't require any kind of precise modeling of how the um, luminosity function of FLBs, what the luminosity function of FLBs looks like, or how it evolves with redshift. And um, there's a nice uh, kind of um, nice fact, which is that uh, the DM is a very similar integral to the optical depth up to one power of one plus Z. And so the two are very strongly correlated. Uh, as you can see here in these uh, black dots on the bottom right figure. So what this means is that um, if you have a measurement of DMAX with some error bars, that immediately translates to a measurement of the optical depth. And uh, it turns out that uh, measuring DMAX to about uh, 500 parsec per centimeter cube uh, is enough to actually improve over uh, Planck constraints on the optical depth. So again, this is something that uh, is possible to do. The, there's difficulties here to do with uh, having to remove uh, bursts which are uh, at low redshift and have anonymously high DM, and uh, having to remove the scatter in the IGM, uh, which will mess this uh, uh, this uh, DMX estimate and will mean that we need more FRBs before we can actually reliably say what this DMX is. But um, these things are uh, doable uh, once we observe enough bursts and. As we uh, kind of mentioned before, there are many, many, many such bursts uh, every day. Um, so let's move so, to the yeah. So Paz, I guess my 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 worry here would be that there's an anomalously high DM at high redshift. Like, would like could you trust this method that that, that it is yeah. telling okay. you reionization history and not and that you're not just unlucky? Yeah, that's that's an important point. So I want to kind of. Uh, um, discuss this a bit further. So uh, that's actually why we had this, uh, uh, I made this point here to, to limit, uh, to make sure that we are not looking at uh, low redshift uh, FLBs with anomalously high DM. And uh, we can do that by just uh, doing optical follow-up and seeing that there are no galaxies in that uh, um, localization. Um, and uh, the, the thing that uh, this gives us is that once we know that this large DM is coming from high redshift, because uh, we have this suppression of one plus Z, if you want to really compete with the DMX on the level of, let's say you want to have a thousand uh, contribution to uh, the DM, you need 10,000 in the host frame if you're coming from redshift of uh, nine, right? So you really need um, a, a very large contribution from the host 
in order to start competing uh, with this uh, DMX. So the fact that we have this cosmological suppression really helps once we can rule out those uh, low redshift interlopers. But, but two questions for me. One, the pre one of the previous slides showed the distinct, you know, the differences between the histories. There was a couple hundred parsec per centimeter cube, not a thousand. And secondly, if you also have to worry about variance in the foreground structures, it would seem you could easily tip over that kind of a level of, of sensitivity. Yeah, so I think a few hundred is realistic for difference between realization histories. But again, that uh, is something that is still a lot compared to the contribution that we expect from these higher redshift um, host galaxies. And um, again, we can look at the data that we have uh, from FRBs with redshift. And for those, the hosts don't seem to contribute much. In some cases, they contribute uh, uh, very little, in fact. Um, you know, uh, an interesting example is the recent FLB from M81, uh, which uh, we know that the host of that one contributed a few tenths of parsec per centimeter cube. And we did some rate estimates, and uh, we think that the bursts from similar environments are actually a good fraction of uh, the total number of uh, FLBs, maybe uh, at the level of, uh, you know, several percent or so. Uh, could be up to 10 percent. And so, if we look at the uh, FLBs from such uh, galaxies, uh, then um, uh, the situation really uh, improves because then we, uh, we really have almost no contribution coming from uh, uh, the host galaxies for, in those cases. Definitely once it's suppressed by 1 plus C. Vikram, I see your hands raised. Sorry, thanks. Yeah, uh, yeah um, just, I just put the points in the chat, but. Um, I guess I'm, I guess I'm concerned about uh, DM host, and this goes back to your previous slide as well. Um, I guess two parts to it. One is, um, isn't this work by Masood and the Chime team on typically high DM hosts, you know, even for FRBs at redshifts 0.3 to 0.5, isn't doesn't does that not remain an issue, whatever its origin? Um, and second second point also is. Are you not worried about cosmic evolution in typical host galaxies such that the ISM may be richer at high redshifts? I mean, it might help you in that you may actually select against FRBs with high TM host, but nonetheless, I, I, are you concerned about that? Yeah, yeah definitely. I mean, uh, the evolution of DM host is something that I think is very important. Um, so uh, what we did uh, is to look at uh, fire simulations, which are zoom-in uh, cosmological simulations of galaxies. Um, and uh, that uh, gives us some handle on what to expect as a function of redshift, as a function of uh, host galaxy mass. Um, of course, uh, these are simulations, so we would still also like to be able to compare these things with actual observations. But uh, this is uh, the best uh, that can be done for now. Um, and uh, yeah, regarding the uh, Masood result, and I agree, there's a, level, there's a signal there that is consistent with a few hundred uh, parsec per centimeter cubes from the hosts uh, at those redshifts of 0.3 to 0.5. Um, if uh, uh, this is really coming from the hosts, then uh, this gives us some idea of what the host contribution is. But again, once we go to high redshifts and we can exclude that a certain FLB is associated with a low redshift galaxy, uh, that level of DM host is not uh, is not a killer. Let's move on to your next slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is a different way of looking at that, and this is to look at just the number of FLBs we see at different uh, DM uh, bins. If you uh, kind of uh, look at a sort of histogram of how many bits we have with a given DM, and you see that uh, you can get these situations depending on the realization history where there's an uptick in the distribution of the NDDM. This is simply because um, uh, we have suddenly uh, the ionization fraction changes dramatically over a short uh, interval in redshift. So uh, actually now we have a lot of FOBs coming from um, different uh, uh, redshifts which are all clumping into the same uh, DM bin. 
and we can get this uh, sort of change in the slope and even lead to an uptick. Uh, and uh, measuring, for example, the number of uh, FRBs in uh, different DM beans, let's say between 5,500 to 6,000 and uh, uh, 5,000 to 5,500, uh, that gives us uh, some proxy uh, on the reionization history and one can um, show that you can really use this to start uh, distinguishing between different histories. Um, but again, this requires many bursts. Uh, so I wanted to point it out just because it's, it's an independent method from the previous one, has its own advantages and disadvantages. And then if we move to the next slide, uh, there is a third method that I want to quickly point out, which is independent from the other two. And this is to have a relatively small sample of FLBs where we also have redshift determination uh, at these high redshifts. And once we have those, instead of talking about tens of thousands of FLBs that are needed uh, in order to get good information about reionization, now the numbers drop down significantly and we're talking about uh, a few tens. So the point here is that uh, you see there are different sources for the scatter that are listed here. Uh, they all decrease with the redshift, as you can see in the plot on the right-hand side. And uh, eventually, um, we can, uh, uh, as we accumulate enough FLBs, we can uh, um, really bring this uh, precision uh, further and further down and uh, get a good determination of the mean density at a given redshift, which uh, tells us basically the ionization history um, as a function of Z. So, Basically, the, the main point that I, I want to emphasize is just that there are different ways that we can look at this problem. They all have their advantages and disadvantages. And by combining uh, these different techniques together, uh, this may actually uh, give us a good chance of uh, measuring those things. So I think that's uh, all I wanted to say about reionization. I don't know if anyone wants to maybe comment at this point or... Actually, let me we should move have on. Matt speak to his slide on reionization to close out that topic and, and then reopen to a broader discussion. Yeah, I'll, I'll just be really quick here. Um, I, I, maybe, maybe one comment um, regarding the DM host. The, I do think there is a good reason to expect that uh, there, there's a population of galaxies at high redshift where they don't have much ISM and maybe DM host is small because the ionizing photons are getting out and it takes very little hydrogen in the galaxy to absorb the ionizing photons and we know the universe is ionized. So, so I, and I think that is reflected in all of these simulations that some of the galaxies blow out all of their ISM. So, but unfortunately those might be the smallest galaxies that are the hardest to actually detect. Um, but okay, so maybe I'll, I, I'm a person who's worked on reionization quite a bit. So I'm just gonna give like kind of a, like an overarching thought which is that there are a zillion papers on reionization and, uh, and, and many of them are claiming constraints on the ionization history, but it turns out that other than the CMB and then the Lyman alpha force gives us a nice limit for when reionization has to end. It's just really hard. I think that, like a lot of these constraints are very model dependent. And, and, and so I do think FRBs could play some role here. I think that it is, um, it, it is kind of pie in the sky, like, which is when I wrote my, like uh, my 2013 FRB paper, I really felt like it was a pie in the sky. Like we didn't even know what FRBs were. So, so I think it's good to be thinking about these things, but I think that we don't, uh, like there's a lot of unknowns here. And, and so I don't really know like how, if, if we're able to really plan for like, like what, or like pl plan what uh, uh, a, um, the right way to target these high redshift bursts are our highest redshift burst is 0.7. So, so, uh, so, so going to redshift seven is, is quite a stretch. So unfortunately we have this huge, uh, we have this huge observatory that's going to be launched. That's maybe our only chance because the, all of the light redshifts in the infrared that is from the galaxy. And so the, like, like it's, you kind of want, if we're, if we're targeting realization, we, and you don't use some of these more clever techniques that Paz is outlining, and you and you just you want to detect the galaxy, then I think you you kind of have to be doing this in the next ten years. And so the and then Paz's paper nicely estimates how many like what fraction of FRBs you might expect to be from the EOR. And so the it is a small fraction, and so we need kind of these big FRB machines to be operating that uh, and and then and then and then we need 
Jason as Xavier to 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 kind of target these the get with with James Webb and so uh, I I don't know uh, like uh, like it is it's something that we need to be thinking about but we we might not have the tools to think about um, yeah and that and I'll I'll leave it at that comments from the crowd feel free to you could just unmute yourself or raise your hand and I can call on you. Pawan, go ahead. So Matt, yes, it is, it is optimistic. It is challenging. I think uh, that was a point that was made, I think very clearly in Binyamini et al paper uh, that the rest of technique is the most challenging one in some ways. Uh, but the good thing is that you don't need redshift for a large number of bars. So the saving grace, if one were to think in that terms, is that you only need a small handful number of uh, FRBs during the reionization epoch between six and 10. Something on the order of 40, 50 uh, will be already quite, in, will provide quite interesting uh, information and constraint on the reionization. Now, is that doable? Well, there are people here in the audience and on the panel who are much more qualified than I am to provide that assessment. My own feeling is that once we have these FRB machines operating, you know, the new, new wor uh, version of, well, let me not say, there are a number of, there are a number of surveys coming online which should get us a few arc second localization. If we can get to about an arc second localization, then the number of galaxies at high redshift within an arc second square is not a large number. It may be order, order unity. And so it would be still very time consuming even for James Webb to chase and find redshift. Um, but if we are able to tag interesting, quote unquote, interesting FRBs, which are potentially at high redshift, it seems to me as a theorist doable. If not, well, that's too bad, you obs my observational colleagues. Uh, let me stop there. Let me turn. No, but on, more seriously, I would love to hear from uh, observers about this point. Am I really mistaken about it? Ryan Shannon, observer extraordinaire, your hand is raised. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to just ask a sort of naive question about what about going and do, doing carbon monoxide? Can we do high redshift CO with BLA or NGBLA or all my type things? Is that is that feasible? Or you know, you, you maybe if we can't. Yeah, you know. I think especially C two is the uh, the there have been. Uh, efforts and I, I think there may be some some high redshift alma detections um the it doesn't tell you it tells you about the galaxy population and kind of in a nonlinear way because c2 is related to star formation but it's in in in, in a way that is requires modeling and it doesn't tell you exactly about the ionization history whereas frbs are like one of the few probes that are are giving you a column of electrons so they're they are telling you about when the universe ionized. I, I think Ryan's thinking is that a, another route towards redshifts other than JW. And, and indeed, oh. it should be. As are ELTs. So JW is not the only ship in town, although it's a great one. Yeah. Um, but is, is there a single observer working on an FRB project willing to raise their hand and, and state they'll get 50 FRBs above redshift six? I think that's what Poan is has laid on the table. <laughs> Deekram says no. <laughs> well, perhaps we need to work harder. Um, before closing out on cosmology, there was a question, Matt, that I think's up your alley. I, I know you addressed it briefly, but from KG Lee. Uh, is helium-2 reionization no longer of scientific interest? Samples of redshift 4 FRBs might come sooner than those at redshift seven. Yeah, I, I'd love I'd love that too. I think same same caveat. I'm more convinced 
that I, well, I, I think I, we, we have some rough idea for when both are happening and, 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 and helium too, I think the, the evidence is a little bit stronger for exactly when, but um, the, um, and, you know, I, I, maybe I, I wouldn't say that very strongly, but yeah, I'd love, I'd love that. It's, it's a 7% effect on DM. The, so, so then, uh, so, so it, 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 it's, it's going to matter what the DM hosts are. But um, but yeah, that that would be awesome. Is any observer project oriented person willing to raise their hand and say we'll have ten retro four FRBs in the near future? Perhaps. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks, um, Pass, for leading that. You know. I, I'm going to take the prerogative of having the slide showed and to bring Dana into the conversation more than she has been to jump to, to a discussion on scattering, if that's all right. So yeah, sure, sounds good. Let's uh, let's jump down there. We, we will defer further discussion on DM host till the end if we still have the energy. Uh, I <laughs> likely won't. <laughs> um, let me know when to advance the, the slides for you, Dana. All right, we can, yeah. So I broke these into um, kind of two different discussions. So I thought we could start off by talking about what we can learn from scattering um, and then move on to why scattering may make it hard to use FRBs as a probe for other science. Um, so, um, so we now, especially with the recent John catalog have a, um, a, a sense of what the scattering uh, is like for fast radio bursts. Um, and this is from a paper um, led by Jim Cordes that was put out today, but it, it shows um, where these lie. And you can see the, the open circles on this plot are upper limits of scattering and the closed ones are actual measurements um, coming from, from CHIME. And so you see this, um, this wide range of, of scattering uh, scales as well as a lot of limits where we haven't actually measured scattering time scales. Um, and so when we want to understand what we can learn from this, um, I think the, the first question and something that we've talked about a little bit already is, um, is what are we actually, um, what are we actually looking at with scattering? Um, so uh, at least at, at uh, low redshifts, um, and especially when we don't have intervening structures between us and these galaxies, um, where these host galaxies, um, I think uh, a lot of, um, there's been a lot of, of uh, work that uh, really think that most of this contribution is, is likely coming from the host galaxy. So um, including like the Macbert and Core paper back from um, 2003, where they looked at the contributions of scattering um, to the, these time scales. So, um, so in many of these cases, we are looking at, uh, at scattering from these galaxies and, and close to the source, um, but we, we uh, um, so we can think of kind of two different classes. One is where we're looking at very interesting sources, and in these cases, for individual uh, in individual scattered fast radio bursts, we really want to be able to say definitively where the scattering is coming from. Um, and so we may want to do something like uh, using galactic uh, scattering to determine whether or not this scattering screen. Um, the scattered disk is resolved by the Milky Way. Um, but also when we have um, many FRBs and we're trying to understand whether or not we're seeing some statistical evidence of scattering, um, we'll have to rely on, or we, and we can take advantage of other methods. Um, and to do this, we really need to understand how the scattering evolves in these host galaxies so we can understand the redshift dependence of, of scattering in host galaxies and compare that to the IGM. Um, so I think that's all I had for this uh, slide. Or do you want to go on to the next one, and then and then we can have some. Allow me to ask a naive question as someone that probably should know the answer to this. But um, do we have a community-approved mm, definition, acceptance, whatever the right word is, of when the width of a pulse is intrinsic and the width of the pulse is scattering? Um. You mean in terms of modeling, or do you mean in terms of? I mean, yeah, when we're going to say tau, which I think yeah. is associated with the scattering. And I 
I so I, I'm interested in the crowd. Uh, Clancy, <laughs> Lion, and Ron, feel free to <laughs> go in that order. <laughs> okay. Jason I was well. just going to say that to first order, I think Jason, the uh, exit, the um, the answer is yes. So I'm not used to seeing the Jason there. I was like, what's going on next? Um, that the answer is yes, in the sense that people find, you know, you take a time domain measurement of your burst and you fit scattering to it, right? You assume something like a uh, frequency to the minus 1.4, so to the minus four for the width. And if you get a significant fit at some, by some definition, I don't know, some number of signal, you say we've detected scattering. And if you don't, you don't. Um, that's the first order. But I think to second order, the answer is no, because there, for instance, with one of the craft high time resolution bursts, it just had a complex pulse model, right? And to do a proper scattering fit, you need, you can model the scattering, that's easy. It's just an exponent, you know, exponential tail convolution, but you need a reasonable non-scattered model to then scatter it. And it just basically got too hard to work out for one of our bursts, what the unscattered model should be because it had some crazy shape. So that was my comment. I'm sure Ryan and Adam could add more. Next to see Ron's hand is up, Ron Eakers. I was just going to say what Clancy said. If you fit the frequency dependence, then the scattering is pretty obvious. However, following up what Clancy said, I wonder how many of the points on that diagram uh, that you just showed, uh, um, whoever showed it, Dana, is it? No, I don't. Yes. Um, how many of those actually have a frequency dependent scattering? That is, you should take away all the points where we don't know whether it's intrinsic or not, would be my only comment. But there's many cases where it is absolutely clear. And of course, Clancy will fuss about the one case in 100 where you can't tell the difference. <laughs> Jason. What did you get, Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I think that, like, you know, these are chime bursts. So I think this shows. Um, uh, when you when you're at low frequencies and you have a, a wide bandwidth, you hopefully can measure that frequency dependence very very well. Um, oh, you can sometimes, but you have RFI limited parts of the band, mm -hmm. so I suspect. So they may all be perfectly good. I don't know. You didn't say. No, I I would have to look at the at the um, actual paper and see which ones. Jason Hessels. Yeah, I was just going to add for, for repeaters, I think it's far less clear because um, with repeaters, um, because of the sad trombone effect, it's very easy to get an asymmetric uh, kind of trailing component in those bursts, which I would argue doesn't have anything to do with uh, scattering. It's probably more likely a radius to frequency mapping uh, effect. And, um, and what concerns me most there is if you, if you take uh, repeat bursts that are sometimes you know, tens of seconds apart, uh, you know, you can find radically different scattering times for them uh, if you fit a scattering tail to them, uh, which I suppose you could arrange, but it requires a very specific type of model to explain why the scattering is changing on such short, short time scales. And also for multi-component bursts, then you would need that the trailing component is scattered, whereas the leading components aren't scattered. You'd expect that all of the components in the burst would show the same scattering time scale. So there it becomes even more extreme. You need some very convoluted model in which the scattering increases drastically right at the end of the pulse, but it's, the pulse isn't scattered at the beginning. And maybe Dana thinks, uh, you know, there are ways to arrange this, and I, you know, there are ways to arrange this, but it doesn't seem like a very natural model to me. I think it's more a, a consequence of whatever is causing the, the sad trombone effect. So for repeaters, I think there, there are some claims of scattering measurements that, uh, that don't make a lot of sense to me. Matt McQuinn, then we'll go to Vikram and Ryan Shannon. Um, yeah, I guess I was wondering, and, and, and this this is for the radio observers. The the like it, at the electric field level, if I'm just correlating, like the like kind of uh, like doing a two point correlation function of electric field, like should I always be able to tell scattering because then 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 I have like more disparate times time scales that are that are correlating, or is is that not the case? You if you had high signal to... noise, <laughs> <laughs> you, you mean looking at like changes in the electric field of time? Yeah, if I did a two-point correlation function in the electric field, then 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 the scattering should always show up. 
as a as a decorrelation. You should see the decorrelation of, or you could yeah, see the, the, the scale of correlation would be different. Yeah. Yeah. But okay, and then um, just a like an unserious comment would be that the scattering is a terrible name name for this. Like it always confuses people. Bikram, then Ryan. Um, I think Matt, that's an, just just first on your on your point. I think that's an interesting thing that um, I think people have certainly tried, and I know that especially the utmost group has really tried hard as the ASCAP group to correlate voltages and um yeah it, it doesn't seem to work and it's not entirely obvious why um that why there isn't a correlated signal um, but just the the question i was gonna sort of and this sort of goes back to both what ron and jason said um jason hessels uh i'm gonna make a slightly uh controversial uh statement that if we cannot mo i guess convincingly model the intrinsic pulse profile I'm not sure that we can convince people that we've detected scattering. Does that seem like a fair statement? Yeah, I, I think that that makes uh, that that makes sense. Um, and I think the cases where we are we are convinced that there is scattering um, are ones where we see a scattering tail that is much larger that has a clear exponential. Um, form and is much larger than the, the like what we model is our intrinsic pulse. Yeah, so I guess coming back to the point that that X was making that I mean, do we have a definition for scattering? Um, I guess the discussion probably shows that we don't. Uh, but maybe but maybe something like that where I, I mean combining the frequency dependence with the exponential with a convincing model for the intrinsic pulse. I would be happy with that. Yep. But I think also like the, the intrinsic pulse, even if we even if we can't separate these, we get a width which tells us something, which tells us an upper limit about scattering, right? And so even that can be interesting, um, especially if we're trying to understand the host environments um, or mm -hmm. intervening systems where we expect to see scattering. That's a great point. Um, Ryan Shannon. Yeah, I guess I mean just start off with the you know, the famous Lorimer paper, of course, said that they saw evidence for scatter, scatter broadening in the, you know, their one bit, you know, filter bank data from parks. And it was the fact that the pulse width was changing with frequency. There wasn't, you know, an obvious scatter, scatter broadening tail there. So, yeah, I think I mean, one, of, one of the issues is, is that, you know, you can contrive a situation where your emission mechanism is producing something that it looks like an exponential that scales as frequency to the minus four as well. So it's, but, you know, I think, but I, I agree kind of, kind of with what you know, people have echoed here about what, you know, what's sort of the gold standard of uh, scatter broadening measurements. I guess the other point I would make is that it's not just scatter broadening, it's also scintill it's scintillation, right? So maybe this gets to the point that Matt maybe is getting at when we talk about scattering, right? It's this, you know, there's two sides of the same coin. So we should also be look, looking at the effect of sort of uh, scint scint scintillation from the host galaxy or scintillation from an inter intervening galaxy as well, and be open, open minded to that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, can, so I, can I just really jump in? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to jump in for a second. I haven't heard anyone say scintillation bandwidth, but there are some cases where I think we've pretty convincingly uh, measured scintillation bandwidth. And if you believe that you can convert that into a scattering time scale, that, that of course avoids all of these profile shape issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's at least one case I see Vikram is mentioning angular broadening. For the first repeater, we measured angular broadening with VLBI as well. Yeah, well, sorry to derail that. I, I'm pretty sure uh, JP worked on that question of trying to uh, match the scattering with the scintillation, and they don't match. I'm just assuming most of the scintillation we see is galactic, and the scattering is well, coming from closer to the host. I think there's no reason that there's no reason that you can't have scintillation from the host galaxy. It's it's completely reciprocal host galaxy and uh, Milky Way. Uh, so if you have the same sort of column of turbulent stuff in the host galaxy, mod modular one plus z factors, like, you know, but. Um, the, the scattering is quite different, right, Ryan, in the two cases. 
between the Milky Way and the host galaxy, Russ? Yeah. I mean, if you have a if you have a system just like, um, just like the Milky Way, you expect it. There's a, a small geometric factor and a um, and a redshift factor, but otherwise the scattering should be the same. Um, so so actually the the scattering time scales should not be that different um, apart from those two factors. Um, yeah. So I think what what Ryan says is is very true that you you could expect to see scintillation from them. Um, from the host galaxies in the Milky Way. Um, and with pulsars, sometimes we see scintillation from, from we see multiple scintillation timescales. And so maybe we should be uh, searching more, um, more thoroughly for that kind of uh, seeing, yeah, two different timescales in our, in our scintillation patterns. Um, I just want to comment quickly on this. Uh... What, what should we expect for uh, scattering screens, both in the Milky Way and, and in the host galaxy? I think there's a lot of free parameters that go into these things. So there's where you put the screen, there's the extent of the screen, there's the uh, Kolmogorov spectrum within the screen and what are the minimum and maximum scales of, those, uh, uh, of this Kolmogorov spectrum. Um, so there's the density, there's all these different things. So, you know, uh, there could be lots of different types of screens, uh, which uh, depend on the uh, nature of the, of the environment relatively close to the source of the FRB, and uh, which have to do with something that uh, is uh, is not commonly seen in, in the Milky Way and is, uh, um, is not necessarily what we have come to expect from, uh, from scattering in the Milky Way. So, yeah, I think maybe we should keep in mind that there's a lot of free parameters that go into scattering. Yeah, Xavier, do you want to actually go to my next slide, which I think talks about a little bit about this too. Um, so I, I wanted to, yeah, to talk a little bit more about scattering, particularly for looking at um, at uh, the host galaxies. Um, and in this case, we, like Pat says, we, we um, might have scattering from some um, some structures or some something weird going on in these host galaxies, in addition to what we expect from turbulence in the ISM of the galaxies. Um, and so uh, the, uh, so Pragya uh, Chala recently um, put out this paper along with the CHIME catalog, where she looked at um, trying to uh, use, like um, trying to use, um, the expectations of scattering based on a model similar to the Milky Way in the host galaxy and adding different scattering and DM uh, contributions, trying to keep to like a normal scattering uh, DM law like what you would expect from the Milky Way um, to model the uh, scattering time scales that they see um, in the chime sources um, and finding that actually uh, you do need, um, you do need uh, more scattering compared to what you would expect for sim for the same dispersion measure in the Milky Way. Um, and But I think that there's a lot that we need to think about here um, before we try to interpret these. So um, so when we're looking at scattering, uh, in this case, uh, we, um, we could be probing two different things. So we could be probing the interstellar media. Uh, and this is pretty, like if, if, we're, uh, if we're convinced that we're looking at the host galaxy and the contributions of the host galaxy, um, so we could be looking at interstellar media that are contributing, um, but also looking at um, at specific structures that are uh, contributing to scattering that are not part of the, the normal turbulent spectrum in the interstellar medium. Um, and so, uh, so one of these is something that we can predict, I think pretty, that, that we have the tools to start predicting. So um, we have some, uh, some theory, which is somewhat supported with observations of, of nearby galaxies of um, how the turbulence in the, these galaxies should change with, with properties of the galaxy. Um, and so this is something that we can start to look at with, um, with simulations um, and also with individual sources where we have detailed follow-up of those galaxies. Um, so for example, we, we expect um, turbulence in these galaxies to uh, if to be um, uh, proportional, the energy should be proportional to star to the star formation rate um, due to stellar feedback. Um, 
uh, uh, driving turbulence. And if that, um, and that means that we can make some prediction with that model of how the scattering should change with redshift or with the host galaxy that we're looking at. Um, and so I think um, this is something that we can start to probe a little bit more is whether we're in this regime where we're seeing um, interesting structures that we don't uh, see in the Milky Way or whether we're looking at um, the change in the galaxy ISM properties, um, either with redshift or, or with these different uh, host galaxies that we're looking at. Let me open the floor for comments on that. All right, should I move on to the next slide? Then? Yeah, sounds good. Um, yeah, so then the other thing I wanted to, um, to bring up is uh, the fact that um, scattering uh, may erase some of the signals that we're looking at, including making it very difficult to detect some fast radio bursts. And so we have this selection effect. Um, and Chime has done some attempts to model this selection effect in their, in their data and find that they're likely missing um, many very highly scattered bursts. Um, and, uh, and so if we can, uh, so there's, there's, um, uh, two options here, we can try to account for these bursts or we can try to find these bursts, but in some ways we need to think of what we're missing um, from this high scattering. Um, so um, these could be uh, uh, bursts that are in interesting environments where they they're have high levels of scattering in their host galaxies from nearby the source, um, bursts that are near the central regions of their galaxies, um, and uh, also um, Stella Ocker talked a little bit today in her talk about um, the uh, chances of um, uh, at high redshift of fast radio bursts uh, going through the interstellar media of intervening galaxies. And in this case, we, they would be highly scattered and we may miss those sources um, scattered to like a second. So, um, so we, uh, and we've also talked a little bit about scattering erasing coherent um, the coherent structure that we might want to use to look at gravitational lensing. So this is a question of, um, I guess, uh, do we do we want to account for these? Do we want to find these? Um, and and how do we find these bursts in our? Um, how do we change our our search to search for these bursts? I'm sorry, Dana. Can you explain the plot a little bit more? Oh like, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Um, yeah. So this is. So this is a plot, um, again, from Priya Chawla's uh, analysis of the chime sources and their scattering time scales. Um, and so um, what she uh, has done is um, looked at the distribution of, uh, of, of, a, of scattering in their catalog um, and um, compared that to their um, to injection tests through the chime pipeline in order to look at the uh, selection um, effects that they have in the Chine pipeline. So here, I, I really just wanted to highlight the blue points here, which are showing um, their expected um, number of bursts in the population based on the combination of the scattering time scales in their catalog and, um, and their uh, injection tests. So we don't see the true one here, right? But I can, I, should I presume it's, Things are pretty complete below whatever, 10 milliseconds or so. Yeah, I think uh, above 10 milliseconds is where they have very low, um, very low sensitivity from their selection, their selection function. Um, Ryan, Shannon, and, and then Sriharsh. Yeah, I guess maybe I'll call this scattering as a way to better do DMZ is a uh, you know, try to use it as a, as a proxy to beta FRBs that have large DM host contributions would be something to think about doing. So it'd be nice, I think once you get a larger sample of localized FRBs to really see, you know, if the ones that are above, above the McCart relation are the ones that are more highly scattered and then either beta them or put it into your gigantic uh, maximum likelihood box and marginalize away. Yeah, that was behind my comment about uh, D. Lee's um, one with the per persistent radio source and the 
sort of thousand units of DM excess. Um, you know, I was, I was looking for a way of getting rid of it so you can still do all the cool stuff. And it, that burst was highly scattered though. So it, like maybe we can get rid of it. Well, I find it hard to believe you can add a thousand units of DM to anything and not get scattering and unless you've got a very contrived um, system that would be adding DM. Certainly in the galaxy, you can't do that. So I, I, I find it hard to believe how you'd be able to do it unless there's something about the source itself that adds the DM. And I guess what's striking so does me about it, anyone... this figure, are we missing half of the FRBs or more? The chime injections say that suggest that we could be missing quite a few, and and not, not just the injections, but the detection of few very uh, highly scattered FRBs in a, in a in a location in phase space where we are not really sensitive is really indicative that there could be a large population. We are co continuing to do the injection tests and. Uh, this result actually does hold. We are very uh, insensitive to highly scattered FRBs, but we still do detect them. Yeah, I just add that like the FRBs that Chime would be insensitive to would still be, you know, detectable at higher frequency because of the frequency of minus four thing. So it's a you know good reason to sort of combine results from different experiments. Absolutely, yeah. So could this suggest that there are more FRBs at low frequency? So it's like thinking of the like Liam Connors plot where the rates are kind of similar, but but I, I guess it's not accounting for the this potential tail of of highly scattered chime bursts. Um, that the like like maybe maybe there's just a, a I, yeah maybe there's a low frequency population that we just don't see don't see at higher frequency. That's possible, but uh, yeah, I think we need to do a combined uh, multi-frequency rate calculation, which you know takes into account all these different uh, selection biases for different surveys. I think Clancy is going to work on it. He promised me on Slack mm -hmm. yesterday. <laughs> Clancy, your hand is raised. Yep, I was going to say exactly the same thing, Shrihash, that yes, we absolutely need this car, you know, the individual experiment response functions and to do this analysis. Um, I wanted to expand on this even a bit more because of course, when people publish FRB rates, right? Um, they publish, you know, based on some assumed sky area. I think Chime's FRB rates take into account their beam shape from what I understand in, in the publication. Maybe someone from Chime can quickly confirm that in the panel where they account for their beam shape sensitivity but I don't think they then reaccount for this sort of scattering effect rate. It's based on the actual number observed. All the parts rates up most and the standard one in craft, so Shannon et al, are based on a sky area of full width half max of beam, right? I, I wrote a paper with some others where I accounted for that effect and it just changes your sky area a bit. Um, and so if you combine the effects of beam shapes with the effects of increased scattering and low frequencies and other telescope response issues. Um, I find that these rate estimates are very, I mean, they're not meaningless, but they're, yeah, they're maybe accurate within a factor of a few, perhaps. Um, and so that's why I generally put more stock on, you know, the Makaratao measurement of the spectrum. Having said that, it's also been pointed out that that paper didn't account for the FRBs it didn't detect. And it actually turns out, um, and this is actually based on an, a, a very insightful referee comment I had on my paper, that um, if you assume FRBs are very narrow band, right? Like they're delta functions in narrow band, then, the, then even though the craft, like the ASCAP beams overlap at the full width half max, um, if there was actually zero spectral dependence in the FRB rate, right? So there's the same number of FRBs at every frequency. We still would have measured 
um, a total spectral index that was new to the minus 0.85, right? Because of the slightly broader beams, even within this. So um, if all FRB the broadband, right? You don't get that, but there is actually a downward bias um, in that. Uh, that'll, that will be some little detail in version four of the paper I'm currently working on. It will be circulated to you anytime soon, X. So. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, I guess it's it's kind of it's fun days where you have these millisecond millisecond uh, scattered ones and, and longer tens of millisecond, and then you also have the microsecond. The like I guess the the rates like yeah I mean depending on where you where where we look like I guess like they, they could explode. Ronnie Chris, uh, maybe a question to statisticians out there, but. I'm wondering if looking at this plot we have uh, on the screen share is a bit misleading because it gives the impression that there's a very large number of very scattered blue ones. Now, I'm assuming these are actually zeros or ones which have been multiplied by a big number due to the bias. Uh, so the errors are gonna be nothing like symmetric. And in any case, they have to be positive. So. I've been trying to think through, isn't this a biased way of looking at the data? Yeah, right. and I think you can, oh, sorry. Oh, I think you can see on this plot that it's kind of hidden by the legend that they're plotting these gigantic error bars for these. So I think you're definitely correct, Ron. And um, yeah, it's, uh, I think it shows that we don't, we don't know. We don't know what, what like we may be missing many, many scattered bursts, but we don't. No. I presume at the end, those error bars actually go way off. Oh, yes, I can see they go up off the top of the graph. Yeah. Yeah, I assume there has to be a model in here on, on how the scattering times distribute, and then you've got your corrections. And that first one's a tough assumption. Still, it's, it's uh, sobering. <laughs> There's the word I'm going to use. <laughs> Other comments on, on this topic? So is there any evidence for scattering from intervening material? Seems like the answer is no. <laughs> intervening uh, I, not being in the host. Well, once, once you have one. Of the host. What is the evidence that it's the host here, Dana? Can you remind me? Uh, so for these ones, there's no, uh, there's no specific evidence. Um, they've done some modeling of the contribution to the, uh, from the IGM, but I don't know that there's been, I, I don't know the details of that. Um, and so, but they, they have done um, simulations here. And so, uh, so I think some of the scatter on, on their, um, yeah, so this is their full DM contribution. And so they've done the, their cumulative distribution includes some fluctuations and what you would expect from, um, from the IGM. Um, so in this case, it's, it's just because of modeling of the IGM. Um, but I think it will be very interesting to look at cases where we can say that the scattering is coming from the host based on, um, based on having res resolution of, um, or like lack of resolution of the scattering and seeing galactic scintillation in the scattering tail, which is something that, that has now been seen for a number of bursts. Um, uh, but the other way is, is very difficult. Like if you see scattering um, and we don't have a good handle on the scattering that we expect to see in hosts and we're looking at individual sources or a small number of sources, I think attributing the scattering to the IGM is very difficult in that case. Um, it's hard to rule out between like in the Milky Way, we see we see um, so much like like such a wide variety of scattering time scales. So, Has? Yeah, just to quickly comment on the scattering in the IGM, the typical time scales there's a lot of uncertainty to do with the in the environment in the IGM, of course. But the typical uh, scattering time scales will be extremely short, and also it's not clear that. Um, in, we will actually be in the strong uh, scattering limit. So that's kind of a 
necessary condition to see any of these uh, effects that we're talking about. And uh, for the IgM, it's kind of marginal. Maybe I should let Matt speak for himself, but I don't think he meant what we call the IgM, what he and I call the IgM, but I think he meant uh, gas in intervening galaxies. Oh yeah, that's, yeah, I agree that uh, there could be some contribution there. And of course it depends on how, how clumpy uh, the environment is, but uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's yeah. what I'm Maybe let me rephrase the question to Dana. Are you convinced, are we convinced that there is excess scattering compared to the Milky Way? Uh, do you mean like that we're seeing scattering from outside of the Milky Way or that? Yeah. At that? yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a question that we can answer um, based on on scattering models. And I think I think that the scattering, you know, the NE2001 model, um, especially if we're looking at a region that's well constrained, I think that that's very, um, very helpful. But then breaking that down, I think, is is quite difficult. So, um, you, so like, like, yeah, being able to attribute it to the um, to the host uh, is something that we can uh, yeah, can use like the, the scintillation, whether or not we see scintillation in the Milky Way. But if we don't see scintillation in the Milky Way, I think we, we really um, need to have, um, have better constraints than any 2001 on what the scattering time scales are in the Milky Way, or we need wide bandwidth instruments that would be sensitive to, um, to very different scintillation patterns because um, any 2001 is a, you know, a factor of a few in the time scales and a lot of the instruments that we're using right now um, to, to uh, search for FRBs, um, you know, it might be marginal if we would be able to detect that or if, if factor of three might be wider than the bandwidth of our instrument. Um, so I think with wider bandwidth instruments and if we have um, uh, um, uh, a better, like, you know, if, if we are using local fast radio bursts to give us better models of our own Milky Way, then, um, then that might help us a lot. And we might be able to be more definitive in saying that we don't see um, scintillation um, when we expect we should. And that a source must be uh, resolved by the galactic um, screen, by galactic scattering. Cool, Ryan Shannon, your hands up. Yeah, uh, I'll be a bit more optimistic. I, I won't say that we've seen it so far. But I would say that I'll give you a scenario where I think we could be confident. Well, I'd be relatively confident in, well, no, no, I'll say it, I'll be confident in saying that it's from the intervening system. So first of all, you're looking at a high galactic latitude out of, you know, capital G galactic latitude. So, you know, you're in regions of, this, in the, in this, in, of the galaxy where you don't really care what any 2001 is saying about, about the Milky, Milky Way. Uh, and then you've localized the FRB and you set, you've seen it's come from like a globular cluster, an early type galaxy, or like 20 kiloparsecs from, from the center of a spiral galaxy. Maybe the, maybe the spiral is face on. So, you know, you're kind of looking at it the same way that uh, it's looking at you. So I think there's, you know, we, there's op op optimism. And then of course, you know, the, 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 the FRB has gone through, uh, you know, a halo of a, for, you know, in the foreground. But I think, so I think there's optimism that, you know, you can, sort of mitigate against uncertainties in host yeah. or Milky Way contributions. Ron, your hand's up, but it's been up for a while. Just <laughs> if you need to say something. Oh, thank you. Uh, someone just raised their hand. Matt, please. Yeah, oh, I, I guess I, I, I agree with that sen sentiment that we're going to, like, if there is intervening scattering we'll be able to figure it out. Like I, I, like I do like uh, Dana's idea of use, using the scintillation from the Milky Way as a telescope. And then, and then we can do stacking, like, like Ryan was saying of like impact parameter, like a like, kind of like uh, Liam and Vikram's analysis, but for scattering. And we, it will, you know, we, if, if they're scattering from CGM, um, at different impact parameters, maybe which I, it's probably much more likely the closer you get to a galaxy, than than I than I than I think we'll be able to tell. I do think that there's the possibility that like at low redshifts the CGM is maybe like um, not not high enough density and and uh, and more 
kind of quiescent. And as you go to higher redshifts, it starts to fragment more. And we might start to see scattering and more in the vein of this refractive scattering that Vindantham and Finney proposed. I think that's, def that's definitely a possibility. So I, I think we should be looking out for for scattering, I think I think it would be really it would be really interesting if we're able to place constraints on 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 um, like cold cloud sizes in 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 halos. Other comments on this topic. Well, that was wonderful. I learned a ton. I have to say. Um, we're an hour and forty minutes in. I'm exhausted. We beat DM host a bit to we a bit already. We could beat it more, <laughs> or we could call it a night. What is or a day or whatever you're at? What do people want to do? Maybe if we want to change topic a bit, we can go to this uh, other cool ideas. Uh, oh, category. Yeah. I forgot about those. Let's finish with two slides and other cool ideas, which I don't even remember. What are here. <laughs> Whoever made these slides, speak to them, please. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess I feel like this has been covered a lot in the meeting, though. Like the, I, I, I feel like this is really like even today we just have tons of results of like probing halo gas. The, so we're doing it faster than we thought we would be able to. I think with with some of the results that were presented this afternoon, my time. Um, so, so yeah, yeah. I, I, I think this is, I think this is the killer, killer science app, at least for the, the first round of FRB observatories. But, um, yeah, there, there are probably others. Any other slide? Oh, Con, Con at all is going to be submitted in about a week, uh, about a month. Which one are you speaking of? Oh, the figure oh, on just, the right. Uh, cool. Yeah, the. But maybe I'll I'll give it a sell, which is that like you guys have heard a lot about halo models and you've heard a lot about um, illustrious simulation, especially, but it's just simulations. And so this is kind of a a, w a way of drawing on, in essence, in body simulations, like various people's models, so that it's a little bit more self consistent in some ways. For and and it'll it's it's super fast, and so the I think like it's something that we we can use as a community to just kind of generate kind of different models. I, I think I think it is nice to have like a, a range of models that we can we can test against the observations. And so the, so this 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 is kind of a it's gonna be a public Python code that does that. Just uh Vikram got his hand raised and on KG too. Um it's really cool stuff that um couple of quick questions. One is uh do you also consider in these models or or, or from, the, from the various simulations uh, sightline sightline variants and incorporate that into the uh, into the code? Sightline to sightline variants. So for example, um, um, so for example, if you you know take probe the same halo at the same radial at the same radius but just different yes. azimuth angles, do you also incorporate that into the code? Oh yeah. Okay. Then the the because it's not a numerical simulation, it, it's kind of uh, it's spherical models for for halos. So the oh, wow. it, it's outside of the halos. It is. So the one thing that this does capture better than than some models is that there is a substantial. You can kind of see that there's like a there's like a break in these models. That that, that that's the two halo term where you know you're. It's just a large scale structure. Um, gotcha. I mean, right. but I I can imagine you can also use these type of this type of thing to like find a local group in the simulation and and uh, you know observe from a like this is something I've appreciated from from Liam's talk and your work that uh, that like maybe the fact that we're in some environment is something that we're also going to have to start taking into account. And so, but, so I think that that would be possible. Yeah, no, no, thanks. I, I thought I, I thought I heard illustrious there. Um, no, so the other really quick question is, and you kind of mentioned this on the SC in with the SC point. Um, yeah. I've always I've wondered this in the last little while. Why why do we not? And maybe it's just me. Why do we not hear more about um, these SC measurements, like from Planck on stacking yeah. galaxies of different stellar masses and looking at profiles? Um, Dude, is that also considered promising? And how how do you think compares yeah. 
FRB measurements. Yeah, that's right. Okay, this and I think this is an important thing to note because this is uh, if you're giving talks on FRBs and you talk about this, like it, it's going to come up. I, there is a CMVS four meeting next week, so and you, I think if you went to that meeting, you would hear a fair amount about this. But uh, so Planck as a beam is huge, and uh, but it, it was able to do really well for thermal SC, but but still couldn't get very close. Could get to about ten to thirteen solar mass halos. Um, and uh, and but but if you look at the and then the but the, because the beam's so large, it's uh, yeah you're you're like they tried to stack on low redshift halos and and uh, and so they have some like kind of detection of of amount of gas that that uh, but that that has been debated. Um, for kinetic SC, you need to you need to use the, the 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 it's act and SPT and especially act because it has galaxies uh, like it, like it overlaps with with boss galaxies and uh, and, and so they can the they, the so Sloan galaxies and so they can stack um, and they have a much better angular, angular resolution uh, the and so what has been done and this has been had this. This came out maybe eight, eight, nine months ago. Is for LRGs because they have really large spectroscopic samples. They they've been able to measure pretty well the the both the KSC and the thermal SCD profile. And so these are ten to thirteen point five solar mass halos. The the but even so for for ACT, I think it has it's you know, it's its beam is arc minute or larger than uh, something like arc minute or uh, two or two arc minute. Um, and and so the the like. The inner within a Vera radius, the measurements are pretty crude. The so this is only um, going. The, it's harder for them to go to lower halo masses. So the, some some people have tried to stack on ten to the twelve solar mass like galaxies using low redshift Sloan. Um, uh, the the the, uh, the these CMV measurements, but the the I think there there's there's some controversy of like and different groups argue. But uh, the so the but those haven't been measured very well. And so the problem with Milky Way mass halos is that the you know, we just don't have large the, the spectroscopic samples where we can reconstruct the velocity field. The, so that's another component of the KSC. You have to reconstruct the the large scale velocity field. So the so the, it's easier to do this with the LRGs and the, like at moderate redshifts. Um, actually, Kendrick Smith has been pretty involved with this. The the so the so the the, the the measurements have are right now really good at 10 to the 13.5 solar mass and it, and they there's not many measurements lower than that the and 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 so the, so i think what where the frbs are going to be able to come in is we we um we can we can stack on impact parameter to milky way mass galaxies even smaller so i think the smaller halos are really where frbs are going to win and and those are also the the, small, the lower mass halos, and and those are also where the beam of the CMB instruments is is not very helpful. So, the, the so so uh, so so I think the FRBs are positioned to do really well for for less massive halos compared compared to CMB, but it is going to be a competition maybe. The so so the CMB community is for, hoping for CMB S four. Which which is able to do this a lot better than 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 ACT, uh, and then Simon's array is is going to do this kind of at an intermediate level. So so these the, between the two, so the so the, so the constraints are going to improve, and uh, and 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 so it, it, I do see it as kind of a competition between CMB and FRBs, and 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 uh, I'm cheering for FRBs, but uh, they and and I think they do have some advantages over over CMB. Thanks. That's really helpful, actually. Thanks. KG, if you, you had a comment, and then Ronnie, please. Oh, sorry, I was just, uh, I forgot what I wanted to say. Sorry. No worries. Ron? Uh, yeah, as Matthew was talking, I was just thinking about the difference between a large beam, as in Planck, and a large error box, as in Chime. And the implications are quite different. That is, the FRBs are a single line of sight through the universe, uh, not averaged over some large region. You just don't know exactly where the line of sight is. And that's totally different than Planck, which has got the integral of everything that happened in the beam. 
so it is got confusion and other problems. So uh, may have been obvious to everybody, but I just haven't thought that through and I thought they would be similar, but I now see they are quite different. I think with that insightful comment, I'm gonna thank the panelists, Paz, Dana and Matt for all their contributions. And you attendees for showing up tonight uh, or today, whatever it is. Um, there is one more session, at least. I think it's one more only. There's uh, one more session, yeah. One more session about... Mm, Late breaking six news. Six hours from now with a penultimate, or sorry, uh, some summary comments from the SOC members that are coherent, won't be me, and Jocelyn Bell. Um, so please show up for that in about six hours.